Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me, with humility, thank all those of you who are here this morning. And those of you who have made some kind remarks, they serve as encouragement for me to continue to serve the people of Antigua and Barbuda. But I struggle with this presentation this morning, having listened attentively to the other presentations that preceded me. And I, as I am inclined to do, is to face the reality of our circumstances here in Antigua and Barbuda. But before I proceed, let me thank the healthcare workers of Antigua and Barbuda who have worked so assiduously in bringing us where we are today that the majority of individuals in this room do not have to wear a mask. <laughs> I want to recognize our nurses, our doctors, the chief medical officer who was the, the right, at the right hand of this fight. We were in the trenches. We experienced all that you heard about COVID. As the Minister of Health, I had to position myself and expect the reports that every day someone died from COVID, it would be reported to me. Just imagine, you get up on a daily basis, and one of the things you have to anticipate is someone to say to you, another person has died. We must therefore appreciate that this conference can be pivotal in addressing the fundamental challenges we face in Antigua and Barbuda and the Caribbean. And one of the things we're going to have to do is to be honest with ourselves in the context of what we call culture, a lifestyle in the Caribbean and throughout the world. That very culture and lifestyle might very well be the problem for us to achieve ultimate healthcare services as well as a healthy nation. I can tell you from the statistics, listening to the doctors, most of the people who have died from COVID are people who are not in the best health condition. And the question will, should be asked, why were they not? Is it an issue of the system or the issue of our educational system or issue of lifestyle? I look forward to that engagement, Professor Lalter and your colleagues, for us to dig deep. We must not waste the lessons of COVID. COVID was devastating, but COVID did something well for the Caribbean. I know I speak for this healthcare system. It graphically exposed the weaknesses of our system and those in Antigua and Barbuda, I'm not suggesting that Antigua and Barbuda was the only one that went through this revelation. It was a worldwide phenomenon. Every Caribbean island discovered that they were not prepared for COVID. No one in the world was prepared for COVID. As the Minister of Health, I don't think there's been another minister in recent times who have had to cope with COVID. So Professor Lalter, let me on behalf of the government express the government's appreciation for the collaboration and partnership that we have forged over the last few years. This conference should have taken place some two years ago, but because of COVID, it had to be deferred. Thank God we can eventually get back on track. 
you made a comment that is very crucial and that is how you blend technical knowledge and skills with the realities that the decisions are ultimately left to the political directorate of a country. How do you blend those two things? That is a great challenge. And that is a question that has not been answered. When we saw people in Antigua and Barbuda contracting this disease from um, the virus, and they were dying, what was the role of the elected body in the country at that time? Was the situation, should the situation have been left only to doctors and nurses? What was the role? When we had social media to fight with in order to educate and persuade people to vaccinate, was that the responsibility only for doctors and nurses and technicians? What was the role of elected officials? What was the role of the Minister of Health? Should I just throw up my hand and say it's a medical issue? It's only an issue for doctors and nurses? Had we taken that posture, Antigua and Barbuda could not have emerged as having the largest percentage of its citizens vaccinated in the Caribbean. <laughs> Had we taken that posture. And then what does that mean in terms of lives saved? Because there were more people vaccinated. In Antigua and Barbuda today, if you combine the actual People, the, the actual number of people who vaccinated, plus those who might have acquired immunity through uh, catching the, uh, the virus, we might very well not be up to the 70 percent. That is uh, the, uh, the standard of, of, um, of the Pan American Health Organization. And so I look forward to, to sit with my colleagues, sit with the, um, the, the team from the university and from PAHO, and let us talk about these things. How do we manage? There's going to be another pandemic. If we have another pandemic in 12 months, where would the Caribbean be? That is an important question. Where would the Caribbean be? Where would we be? In terms of the devastation, and, and I must apologize, I was given a script, but Having listened, I have departed from the script. Where would we be? And I apologize for those of you who work so hard in preparing this. <laughs> but these are the issues. Let us not miss the opportunity to face the reality of our circumstances. When we wanted um, equipment, to save lives, the ventilators and the other type of equipment. We follow the international standard of placing orders. Most of the equipment would come through the United States. And then we heard the United States place an embargo on exporting any medical equipment to the Caribbean. These are the political decisions. What should the government do under those circumstances? So we were not able to get, what, the ventilators? And so we had to find innovative ways to get the ventilators here in Antigua and Barbuda. I cannot reveal some of those ways. <laughs> we had to ask for gifts instead of purchasing. So we got some gifts. And so the reality is that the people of Antigua and Barbuda and the Caribbean should appreciate that now with the University of the West Indies and all the individuals in the healthcare system, PAHO, we must get busy preparing for the next pandemic. And then having faced international um, difficulties, um, 
trade interruptions, uh, cannot get flights out of the United States. I'm talking about flights. How many countries in the Caribbean had to close their borders? All the Caribbean countries had to close their borders. How many Caribbean countries depend on tourism? All the Caribbean countries depend on tourism. COVID brought a halt to international trade insofar as the Caribbean is concerned. How did we as a country was able to achieve the position where we were able to open our borders sooner than any other Caribbean country. And these are some of the things that we'll share when we get in the technical um, sessions. But I would say to this gathering, the hard political decisions that had to, make, had to be made were made. We had to basically take over a hotel in Antigua and Barbuda, the Hawksbill Hotel. We had to take it over under the laws of Antigua and Barbuda and made it a quarantine and isolation facility. You all might not have heard this, but individuals coming in, whether you're a citizen, and here's the political aspect of it. You had citizens coming back to your country, citizens and residents, and you say to them, you cannot go to your home. You cannot go to your village. Because of our culture, you run the risk of spreading the virus. You know what happens when you come back home from overseas. You want to see auntie, uncle, grand. You want to see everybody. You move from house to house to greet. Those things could not have been allowed under COVID. And so the difficult political decision was that every citizen or resident coming back to Antigua had to go to quarantine or in isolation. That was one of the reasons why maybe the Minister of Health was not so loved. <laughs> but I don't think it is that way now. I think that Antiguans and Barbudans clearly understand now that some hard political decisions had to be made. So the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, political belief and socioeconomic condition is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. And we take that seriously in Antigua and Barbuda. But what does that really mean? It means that all people throughout their life course must have access to requisite health services when and where they need them and without the fear that the cost of paying for these services would plunge them into severe financial hardship. Let me pause here to say, this is really a fundamental pillar of health policy in Antigua and Barbuda. I don't know how many of you are aware, and Mr. Silston more than anyone else, and the chairman would be aware of this, but over the last eight, nine years, we gave grants of over $27 million for citizens and residents of this country to travel abroad because the healthcare service they required were not available in Antigua and Barbuda, $27 million. This government, through the medical benefit scheme, Mr. Silston, and so I have to recognize the role you're playing. And Mr. Chairman, uh, may I publicly express my appreciation for your cooperation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
These services must be equitably distributed and staffed by competent workforce in adequate numbers uh, at the primary and sec secondary level. And I do not want to be long, so I'll make the most fundamental point that I'll make here this morning. And that is, we are not going to win this battle without accepting that the success is based on a deeper and sharper focus in building our primary healthcare system in Antigua and Barbuda. If we cannot get the primary healthcare system right, then it will place a burden on our secondary and tertiary services. And as we are seeing it now, you go to the emergency room in the hospital, difficult to cope. And if nothing that I've said this morning that you remember, please, we have to look closely at our primary health care system and invest the highest return of investment in the healthcare system, dollar for dollar, is what you invest in the primary healthcare system. That's one lesson I've learned. I've seen it. The other thing is that investing in the primary healthcare system contemplates an appreciation for education, especially at the primary school level. Many of the bad habits, and let me be very frank, that we all have engaged in, in terms of our health, could have been avoided if at a very young age, the way you were taught to walk, the way you were taught to speak, you were given lessons of how you can stay healthy. It's amazing to me that our healthcare system, even in the curriculum, is not designed to create a culture in our young people. What should you eat? What should you drink? Let them know about rest and good habits. That is not taught in our primary school. Of course, we teach them a lot of science and mathematics, and they become scientists and very good intellectually and academically, but they die earlier because they, at a young age, they are not taught about diets, good diets. Let's go back to the basics in our healthcare system. We are spending too much money on our secondary and tertiary healthcare in Antigua and Barbuda and throughout the world. And so this morning, I will curtail a certain part of my presentation and stick to the facts that when the, the government, for instance, invested over $100 million in, in infrastructural work, where we had to spend money in building an infectious disease center, that is an investment in preparing for the future. If ever we have another pandemic, we have the facilities in place to isolate people who are seriously ill. We have, we have invested in another facility on Nugent Avenue. You, you are from Antigua who don't understand, know this um, facility. We can create an option for infectious diseases. All these investments, can give them all to you this morning, cost us about 100 million US dollars. And that's a fact. So we are preparing for the next, um, the next uh, pandemic. We are also preparing to have a stronger healthcare system so that our people can be, remain healthier and go up in a better environment. And lastly, the national health 
insurance. You are quite right, Mr. Chairman. Many people thought it was too far-fetched. The preliminary information coming out from the Health Economic Unit is that Antigua and Barbuda already spends an enormous amount of money for health care. And it is unlikely that there will be any dramatic increase in the current contributions to medical benefits. And if we can, not if, when we achieve the national health insurance, it means that every citizen of this country can be assured that he or she can go to any private facility or any public facility without being financially embarrassed. We must achieve this in Antigua and Barbuda. We are working hard at it. And I want to recognize the leadership of the Prime Minister who have made all these financial resources available and a cabinet that worked with alacrity in putting in place the necessary policies that has not only helped us to put us in a place uh, where we are today in so far as COVID is concerned, but has positioned us for us to make the appropriate investment in order that Antigua and Barbuda can see and achieve its objective of making healthcare available, affordable, at the highest level for all its citizens and residents. It's an honor for me to participate in this conference, and it's an honor for Antigua and Barbuda to host this conference. I want to express to PAHO, to University of the West Indies Health Economic Unit, to the citizens of this country who complied uh, with the policies of this government, and even those who did not comply but now probably have seen the wisdom of policies that have worked for us, as well as all the healthcare workers in particular. May God continue to strengthen you, and may you continue to experience the best of health and let us all work together as a nation to fulfill the potential of this great nation of Antigua and Barbuda. Thanks again, and may God bless you.